Welcome to Spew, Spectrum People Enjoying Wizardry. I'm Queerness, and I have Asperger's Syndrome. I'm Lavender, and my daughter, Abby Kadabi, has nonverbal autism. And I now call this 23rd meeting of Spew to Order. Lavender. Hello, Queerness. How are you? I'm good today. How are you? I'm good. Not really a lot has happened. Quarantine is kind of boring. Yeah, it's kind of gotten boring at this point now. I'm kind of bouncing around from one crazy career path to another. Last week, I wanted to start a circus. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and exploit my disability for money. And my daughters. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I frown upon those camps that overcharge the parents and then the kids put on a terrible show at the end of the week. I'd much rather let the kids participate for free and then put on a show that you can overcharge people because autistic kids are doing good stuff. <laughs> I do like your business model a lot better, I have to say. But this week, my crazy plan was to uh, become a Bob Ross certified instructor. Oh, there you go. That's not a bad idea. And then, you know, I did the math and realized it's going to cost me about 5000 bucks up front. Oh, what? No, that's a terrible idea. No. Because you have to pay for the class. It's in Florida, so I need an Airbnb. And then I'd need to buy all the supplies for students to be able to have a class. Art supplies are expensive. Mm-hmm. And then somebody at my local Hobby Lobby is already teaching Bob Ross classes, except down at the bottom, it says not a certified Bob Ross instructor. So like, <laughs> copyright infringement? Oh, wow, that's a lot for one class. Well, it's a month-long class. It's three weeks. It's a lot. Well, it, it's 1200 for the three-week class, 1200 for the Airbnb, then about 2500 for all the art supplies for a class set. Moral of the story is we should pay teachers better. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good moral. <laughs> Just a quick bit of context for this episode. Uh, most of this episode was recorded at the end of May, just as the Black Lives Matter protests were just barely starting to get started. So you may hear a little bit reference to that throughout the episode. What are we talking about this week? We're talking about the first little bit of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. I'm going to split this up into a few episodes. Goblet of Fire was released July 8th, 2000, and J.K. Rowling had a really hard time with coming up with a name. She kind of bounced back and forth between Goblet of Fire and Triwizard Tournament, and her third option was actually used on Scholastic promo art for pre-orders as Harry Potter and the Doomspell Tournament. And there was originally supposed to be an estranged Weasley cousin named Mafalda, who is the daughter of the second cousin who's a stockbroker that was mentioned in the first book. Hmm. She was supposed to be sorted into Slytherin and was meant to be like a Slytherin spy. But then she realized that because she was trapped in the same school as everyone else, she really couldn't learn as much info as she needed her to. And she already had Rita Skeeter, who was kind of fulfilling that part. Mm -hmm. So she kind of merged the characters into Rita Skeeter and dropped Malfalda altogether. But then that created a major plot hole in the chapter The Dark Mark, and she had to rewrite it like over a dozen times. Hmm. Interesting, because that's a kind of a heavy chapter. Yeah, there's a lot that goes on in that chapter. Yep. So let's, uh, let's just dive right in. Yeah, so the first chapter, The Riddle House, is my favorite chapter in the whole series. Really? This one and the chapter from, I don't remember if it's book five or six, but the one with the fox, that you're following the fox, and then all of a sudden there's a green light, and then Bellatrix is there. I like these weird out-of-body chapters where you're following a random unimportant character. I think that was Half-Blood Prince. Yes, it is, because they're going to visit Snape. Snape. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the first thing I noticed in the Riddle House is basically the whole town's response is that Frank is odd, therefore it must have been him that did it. Well, there's a little more to it when everybody is kind of discussing it. And who could it be? Who Who's done this? There's a, quite a few people that 
come to Frank's defense at first, but then by the end of the conversation, the whole town is convinced it's Frank, yes. It, it just doesn't take a lot to convince anyone that it's him. It doesn't, no. Also found it just kind of interesting. Frank was devoted to the grounds. That, like, his whole life is about taking care of these grounds, even though there's no one to take care of them for anymore, really. But he continues to do it, because he wants to keep taking care of them. Got nothing better to do. Also, Wormtail has no friends, and I don't care. He deserves it. He says, I am a faithful servant. Because Voldemort says that his faithful servant has returned to him. And Wormtail kind of takes offense, and he says, I am a faithful servant. He's not. He's He's not. Awful. He's a coward. And I find it super interesting that, like, Voldemort knows that Wormtail is only there because he's too scared to go anywhere else and do anything else, and he still keeps him around. Like, he knows he's not a faithful servant, but that he's just too much of a chicken to do anything else or go against him. And that w- that leads me into my next point, which is actually that Voldemort loves foreshadowing as much as J.K. Rowling does. Because mm-hmm. he responds to this by saying, faithful servants would give their right hand. You'll be useful in the end. Mm-hmm. That's some... Tricky, tricky. Strong, strong foreshadowing right there. Yep. <laughs> That's not even foreshadowing. That's just like, you're going to give your right hand before the end of this book. <laughs> The next chapter, The Scar, Harry creates conversations in his head. They're accurate conversations, which is not my experience, but he creates conversations in his head because he has no one to talk to. Well, and he's trying to imagine how his friends would react to his scar hurting. But yes, you're right. He he is creating the conversations in his head. And then when he was trying to figure out how to actually, like, explain this to, like, Dumbledore, he says, Sorry to bother you, but my scar hurt this morning. And and this is something that I noted, too. Like, why does he not think that this is a big deal? Because he's been taught his whole life that his pain and suffering does not matter. I mean, he even says to himself in this chapter, you know, last time my scar hurt, Voldemort was near. And he doesn't think Voldemort is near, you know, out on Privet Drive. But, I mean, that's still, I would be uneasy. And then when he finally does write a letter to Sirius, it's very wordy, mostly pointless, and leaves off all the important stuff. And he basically says at the end, by the way, sorry to bother you, but my scar hurt this morning. (laughs) (laughs) So he's he's a little off-put by it, but not... (sighs) He's not scared by it. Right. And then just a couple hours later, he's just completely opposite. He's completely blissful. He's just got good news that, number one, he's going to the Weasleys for the remainder of the summer, no matter what. No matter if the Dursleys say yes or no. (laughs) He's going to go see the Quidditch World Cup, where he didn't even have to buy the tickets. They were just presented to him as a gift. And he gets to eat cake for breakfast instead of grapefruit, which is nasty. (laughs) So he just, he wasn't bothered enough for my liking. (laughs) Then in the next chapter, The Invitation, I always pictured Molly being the one that would be able to communicate with muggles the best for some reason. But this letter kind of proves the opposite. She's not terrible, but she actually calls them muggles. She did her best. And then um, when Harry is saying, you you have met her before. She was Ron's mother. And he's like, oh, right. Loads of red haired children. And he calls her Dumpy, he which does. coming from Vernon is really rich, really rich. J.K. Rowling writes a lot of stuff about weight, but that's a whole other issue. Also, Harry asks a favor and then immediately turns around and says wizard post. He like completely gives up on trying to be on Vernon's good side and just leans right into it doesn't matter. So I'm going to do what I want, (laughs) which I find kind of irritating because I can't help but feeling that if he, well, every time he tries to do what Vernon wants, it always fails miserably. Well, and he was conscious of the fact that he had said wizard post and like immediately knew that he had messed up. What I don't understand from Molly's letter is when she says, you know, write us back in the normal way. I don't think the postman knows where our house is. Does she really expect this muggle family to know what the normal way is or how to do it? That's what I'm saying. The fact that she seems to not have any idea how to communicate with them in the slightest. Like, I mean, Arthur doesn't really completely understand and he's completely (laughs) off base but i feel like molly would just kind of understand (laughs) nope not the case 
back to the burrow. Uncle Vernon calls them their kind. And then Arthur to Vernon says, you aren't going to see your nephew till next summer. Surely you're going to say goodbye. I like Arthur. I do too. I love that he stood up for Harry there. He's very bad at standing up for what's right, but he likes to stand up for what's right. He tries his best. And then my favorite quote in, this is honestly, it's one of my top five favorite quotes from Harry Potter. This this sentence, or this group of sentences. And it's, the idea of being taught consideration by a man who had just blasted half his living room wall seemed to be causing him intense suffering. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And then Dudley taking the Weasley twins a candy bait, like just perfectly. That plan that they had worked so perfectly because Dudley is a pig. Every time I have read this chapter, I'm just like, why does no one warn Dudley not to pick up anything they dropped? Like, it doesn't occur to anyone. Like, it's so obvious that that's what they're doing. Not what the outcome is going to be, but that they've dropped candy. Arthur's always trying to see the best in the boys. <laughs> but then Dudley, Dudley then eats the candy and you, we all know, you know, his tongue swells up crazy long to the size of like a, they said a four foot python. And Petunia is trying to rip Dudley's tongue out. She's just in pure panic, like on top of him trying to rip his tongue out. Like what good do you think that's going to do? <laughs> And then I just noticed this for the first time, I think, when I, I read it again these past couple days. I never realized that Uncle Vernon, like, physically threw China figurines at Mr. Weasley right as Harry was getting into the fire. Yeah. It... I'd never noticed that before. Again, we have an example of people not communicating and not listening. <laughs> Communication breakdown. Next chapter was Weasley Wizarding Wheezes. Weasley's Wizard Wheezes. Weasley's Wizard Wheezes. That's the one. Uh, when talking about giving the candy to Dudley, Fred says, we didn't give it to him because he's a muggle. Which is where Arthur's mind first jumped. Like, you know, this seriously violates wizard muggle communications, whatever. We didn't give it to him because he's a muggle. That's like one of those not racist racist things. Yeah, kind of. We've been hearing explosions out of their room for ages, but we never thought they were actually making things. <laughs> we just thought they liked the noise <laughs> and i love how arthur threatens the twins he's like wait till i tell your mother and he never truly intends on telling molly just because he doesn't want to deal with the headache of it all i do love arthur one of my favorite characters <laughs> hermione was hovering near the hedge apparently torn between amusement and anxiety that that one touched me like yep ow <laughs> for some reason molly talking to herself while making dinner really stuck out to me. I don't know why, but it did. She wasn't even talking to anyone specifically. She was yep. just talking. Yep. 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 And Percy is judgy. Yes. Percy's very stuck up. Very much so. I found it strange that Bertha Jorkins was from the Ministry of Magic, happened to be in holiday in Albania where they found her, killed her, and then immediately came to London where she was already. <laughs> Just the, the, the whole idea that she was only killed because she happened to be vacationing in the place that Voldemort was leaving. It's just kind of odd to me. Hmm. And in, in this book and a little bit in the last book, we're getting more of people just kind of glancing at Harry's scar and moving on. And it says that Harry was used to people looking at him. Yep, just a, you're different. I'm not going to acknowledge it, but we both know that you know that I know that you're different. <laughs> well, the full quote is, Harry was used to people looking at him, but it always made him feel uncomfortable. Yep. And also, Amos Diggory is a braggart. Yep. You beat Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> and then as they show up and they're looking at all of the people dressed like muggles, we have this conversation of, there's a bloke walking around in a kilt and a poncho. Shouldn't he? Asked Mr. Weasley anxiously. <laughs> if you go and you read this chapter, if you read Bagman and Crouch, and you <laughs> specifically just look for all of the clothing items that wizards can't figure out, it's really quite entertaining. I highly recommend it. There's, a lot of them are quite 
obscure is not the right word, but they're definitely not everyday clothing. One man wanted to wear a, you know, a women's nightgown because it was the closest thing they had to <laughs> to wizard robes and he liked a nice healthy breeze. Yep. <laughs> Uh, when they were uh, putting up the tent, it says that Mr. Weasley was more of a hindrance than a help because he got thoroughly overexcited when it came to using the mallet. <laughs> he also didn't want to use the oven that was provided in this magical tent <laughs> because of, you know, <laughs> muggle precautions, basically. And he says, you know, when muggles camp, they cook over a fire. I've seen them at it. And I want to know, <laughs> when did Arthur see muggles camping? <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> He's staring at them from the hedge with anticipation and anxiety. And then the kids go out to like get water and we see some American witches for just a brief moment at the, they have like a, I guess a tent, like a stand basically that you would see at a fair or something with the Salem Witches Institute. Ah, yes. They were described as gossiping. <laughs> <laughs> And when we finally meet Barty Grouch, he is wearing a suit and is the only person who seems to be fitting in. And Harry could see why Percy idolized him. Percy was a great believer in rigidly following the rules. And Mr. Crouch had complied with the rule about muggle dressing so thoroughly, he could have passed for a bank manager. He was spiffy. Real spiffy. But I find just overall in this chapter, the failing to fit in with clothing is very, very fitting, very autistic people don't like following the normal rules when it comes to wearing clothes. We're not allowed to wear plaids with stripes? Well, die bag dong dong it. I'm wearing plaids with stripes. <laughs> uh, we went through just a very, thankfully, short phase where Abby didn't really want to wear clothes at all. So yeah, I get it. That is a common phase. I know. <laughs> Thankfully, it didn't last long. And and for many years, actually, we didn't have to deal with it too much last summer. But for the few summers before that, every time we would take her to the pool, she would try to strip down and jump in the pool because, you know, to her, it's just a giant bath. Mm -hmm. And you don't wear clothes in the bath. But we finally got over that hurdle as well. <laughs> and then the next chapter, queerness, you're going to be mad at me, but the next chapter was quite boring for me. <laughs> I think the Quidditch chapters are much better when you're listening to the audiobooks because it sounds like a play-by-play -play commentary and it's surprisingly exciting. I find reading it to be boring. The Quidditch chapters are always my least favorite chapters. <laughs> No, that's terrible, but they're just, they're hard to read. And then, oh, I, there were some muggles, and Mr. Weasley says, bless them. Pulled out an old southern standby. <sighs> Winky does what she's told in this chapter. Winky was a good house elf. Winky was a good house elf. Crumb's a cheater. He dived to make the other person dive, and then pulled out of it and hurt them. He got a foul for it, though, I think. But he is still a cheater. He is still a cheater. And this is the first time I realized, also, that when Harry is looking through the Omninoculars, Mm -hmm. And he he replays that that specific play that Crumb does the cheating one. They they read off the Quidditch play name. Mm -hmm. Never noticed that before. That's some advanced technologies there, right? And, and Crumb was less coordinated on the ground and slightly duck footed. <laughs> I'm not very coordinated on the ground. I'm not very coordinated anywhere. Also, I am duck footed. I've never heard that term before. Duck footed. I can turn my feet like almost all the way around. It freaks people out. Oh my out. gosh. Oh, yeah, don't ever do that in front of me, please. <laughs> and we also... <laughs> This part always cracks me up. We learned that the Bulgarian Minister of Magic does in fact speak English. He just really thought it was entertaining to watch Fudge mime everything for a whole day. Yeah. <laughs> I find that kind of entertaining myself. <laughs> Here's a trivia question. Who is the missing witch that everyone is concerned about at the ministry? Lavender. I've already said her name, <laughs> but no one remembers her name. Who is it? It's Bertha Jenkins. <laughs> it is Bertha Jorkins. Oh, it's Jorkins. Man, I was going to say that, but I thought I was wrong, so I, I went to Jenkins. Darn it. <laughs> I was almost right. This is also a badly worded question because... No, everyone at the ministry is not concerned about her. That's kind of the point. Exactly. It's almost quite the opposite. They're all not surprised that she's lost. Then we get to the dark mark. And Winky starts off by saying, there is bad wizards about. I would 
like to take this moment to just reiterate again, I am still so upset that the movie The Goblet of Fire did not include Winky at all as a character. Yeah, all the house elves are cut and it's so sad. Although there's like three frames where two house elves are riding on the back of a llama. What? Yeah, there, there's like a very fast little thing where there's two house elves riding on the back of a llama. Yes, I must see this. Also, this chapter mentions vampires again. <laughs> now, since they don't go to Diagon Alley in this book, this is still the chapter before they get their school supplies. So it's still following this weird pattern. Also in this chapter, you realize that Bagman is, he is completely oblivious to what is going on around him. He is late showing up when uh, the dark mark appears. And and at that point, he doesn't even know that Death Eaters were out, like, levitating people. He's doing something suspicious in the woods. Then he, like, runs away. And then he comes back and he still doesn't know what's going on. Mm Mm-hmm. Just, Bagman is oblivious. (laughs) I do just love Winky, though. I do, too. And she totally deserved a role in the movie. I love Winky. I I love Creature. Dobby annoys me. (sighs) The way they portrayed Dobby in the movies annoys me. You don't like Toby Jones? I didn't say that. (laughs) (laughs) I just think they could have done Dobby better. Amos Diggory jumps to conclusions. Like, he's not even the one that's, like, running this witch hunt. He just kind of is all like, Oh, found Winky. We know what happened. End of search. Yep. (laughs) Winky created the dark mark. Yeah, he's kind of rude. He is. I think he was just tired. You think he was just tired? No, I think because because uh, Amos, he was like the head of the Department of Magical Creatures, something with to do with magical creatures. So like this was his job was like if if an elf or a coblin, you know, had a wand, it was his job to p- procure charges against them. So I think no, I think you're right. He just jumps to conclusions because of his job, which I find it kind of odd. That she didn't introduce him in the last book when it came to Buckbeak. No, he wasn't mentioned at all. Cedric was, but right. the fact that Amos wasn't introduced in that book as part of that group, I find kind of interesting. And seeing how Winky is treated is kind of ultimately what spurs Hermione to start spew. Now is not the time to discuss house elf rights. It's always a good time to discuss house elf rights, if you ask me. <laughs> spew forever and then in the middle of the ministry clot trying to clean up this mess percy says i can give my cauldron report to fudge in person he's always looking for that way in i don't know if you noticed this but vampires are mentioned again in this chapter. they are they are and then i just love this random ron fidgeting absent-mindedly with the hole in his chudley cannon's bedspread yeah he needed something to do with his hands <laughs> it's a very specific unnecessary piece of information that i very much relate to i think i think she put it in there to show that ron was feeling uneasy and, and fidgeting also chudley cannons because at this point harry is telling ron and hermione that his scar hurt just a few days before mm-hmm. and i think it makes him nervous so he gets fidgety And then she used the word ferreting again. (laughs) Yep. Which, in my initial search, I could not find any definition site that was using it to mean to root around or look for something. But then today I looked again, and now that's the second definition on every page. I'm like, there wasn't a second definition two weeks ago when I was looking at it. The definition that I found for ferreting was hunting rabbits with ferrets. Yeah, that was what I had found too. But now... There is a second definition that means to root around and search for something. J.K. Rowling changed the dictionary. More than once, though. (laughs) I looked it up again because I was watching another British show where they also used it. And I was like, wait a minute, this many people can't be misusing it. Hmm. I wonder if it's just a very British phrase and it means something different here versus the UK. No, because, I mean, it definitely feels, it fits into that second definition. That's what it means. It's just, it's not what the word actually meant. It does now. According to the internet. The police are referred to as the please men. Which is so cute. (laughs) Why do wizards not have please men? They have arrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
Yes. Yeah. And they make light references to his paranoia and obvious PTSD. Mm Mm-hmm. There's a lot about this character introduced quite early on that I completely forgot about. That, like, we are basically let known about the time when he was abducted Mm -hmm. in the plot of the book. And one of the twins said... Dumbledore is not what you would call normal. I mean, he's a genius and everything. Dumbledore has autism. (laughs) He's not normal and he's a genius. That (laughs) is the definition. Also, the snack cart is now referred to as the lunch cart, but they still just buy cauldron cakes. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't hear of any, like, lunch being offered, just snacks. And Hermione keeps using magic out of school. Did you notice this? I know. I do. She used it at the Quidditch Cup. She did? And then she used it again on the Hogwarts Express. And it's like, I know they can't track it because she's in a crowd. But like, why is she just like using it so often? I get the first time she used Lumos because it was an emergency and people were tripping and falling. and Right. But she's just using it all over the place. Bending the rules. And once again, Malfoy's parents have told him about the Triwizard Tournament coming up, and they tell him everything. Do they have no filter? No, no. White supremacists do not have filters. They just, like, (laughs) brag about it, and people, like, ignore it. Well. Now we meet Dennis Creevy, (laughs) who is absolutely delighted about falling into the lake. Well, he's delighted about falling into the lake and getting pushed back into the boat by the squid, which makes me wonder, is the squid trained? There are theories about this. A lot of people believe since Hagrid is not allowed to magically propel the boats, even though we have seen him magically propel the boats, that perhaps the squid is the one moving the boats. Hmm. I'll have to look up these theories because I'm genuinely curious now. And I love this quote from Dumbledore talking about the Quidditch Cup being canceled by something that will be taking up all the teacher's time and energy. (laughs) So get excited. I... I don't know if this was meant to be Dumbledore being passive aggressive about this or if he's excited for the students. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> and we also get Neville is going to enter the tournament because he doesn't want to disappoint his grand. Bless Neville's heart. Bless him. I also realized when they're they're kind of, you know, panning across all the professors and they mention per- Professor Sinistra. Mm-hmm. We never meet her or him. We never meet them. There's there's a few professors that we don't ever hear about except once or twice. The Muggle Studies professor, we I think is mentioned like once somewhere like in the last book. When she dies, yeah. <laughs> but she dies and she gets fed to Nagini. We also learn in this chapter, which I just think it's a fun little bit of trivia, um, that Hogwarts has the largest number of house elves in a single dwelling in Britain, mm-hmm. which makes sense. I mean, we learn a little bit later that it's not as terrible as their other situation, but it's still kind of disappointing. But like, it's like one of those charities that helps by perpetuating the stereotype. Yeah. You know, like autism speaks. <laughs> Ooh. And then we finally meet Mad-Eye. And Mad-Eye knows how to make an entrance. He can control thunder. <laughs> no, he can't. It seems like he can. He just has very good timing. He opened it on the thunder beat and boom. Yeah, good timing. <laughs> and those are the first 12 chapters. There's not a, a, enough going on yet for me. I haven't came across any overarching themes yet. No, I, I, I didn't either. That always happens more and when you get deeper yeah. into the book. The first few chapters are always very hard to look at through an autism lens, I feel like. Now, news for the month of June going into July here. We got some follow-ups to J.K. Rowling's, I don't know what to call it. <laughs> um, Rampage. <laughs> sure, Rampage sounds good. So, she returned to Twitter For the most part, she was returning solely to comment on children's drawings for the Ichabog. Nothing bad, just trying to keep up for the publishing of the book that is still planned for November. In response to that, there were several employees from Hatchet, who is the UK publisher for the book, were protesting working on the book. So Hatchet had a meeting and said that each employee will speak to their managers individually. So, this is Hatchet's official statement. 
Freedom of speech is the cornerstone of publishing. We fundamentally believe that everyone has the right to express their own thoughts and beliefs. That's why we never comment on our author's personal views. And we respect our employees' right to hold a different view. We will never make our employees work on a book whose content they find upsetting for personal reasons. But we draw a distinction between that and refusing to work on a book because they disagree with an author's views outside of their writing, which runs contrary to our belief of freedom of speech. We are approaching all conversations with empathy and compassion on a case-by-case -case basis. Interesting. So they just, they said a lot of words to say nothing is kind of what that feels like. <laughs> they said a lot of words. I don't totally disagree with the statement. I don't either. The, I do feel like they are not listening to their employees' feelings here. I mean, they basically said that they aren't. They said, you know, our managers are basically going to deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis, and we still believe that they should be made to work on this book. Yeah. But they can go to their managers and express their frustrations, is essentially what that feels like. Yeah. That's... 100% what what that's what's going on. I'm hoping they won't be punished for expressing to their managers any frustrations that they no, have. No, I don't think that's going to happen, but and I do agree with the statement that the book itself doesn't contain the specific objectionable material, therefore Right. I mean, I guess they did all right. It just feels like they said a bunch of nothing. <laughs> We had a similar situation with the Blair Partnership. The Blair Partnership is a publishing agency that was formed in 2011 specifically to sign J.K. Rowling. And they had four authors resign, two of which are actually a trans couple. And the reasons they gave for resigning is they noticed that senior members of the agency expressed support for her views. And so they requested to have a open dialogue to explain why her remarks were damaging and the request was denied and so they felt that the company was not living up to their mission statement of progressive is our watchword yeah i would say so and then this is carrying on over into the united states unfortunately so the equality act which is an lgbtq civil rights bill was brought to the U.S. Senate floor on June 18th, and Republican Senator from Oklahoma, James Lankford, quoted J.K. Rowling's essay, and in doing so, successfully blocked the vote from taking place. It's also important to note that this did take place four days after the Supreme Court actually held that basic rights were protected by the existing laws. Mm -hmm. So, not a complete loss, but... Boy, is that disappointing. Yeah. And then, Literature Newspaper, a North Korean state-sanctioned paper on books, has actually spoke in support of Harry Potter, stating that it is good for children. So, less than two weeks after her statements, North Korea now thinks Harry Potter is good for children. Well, good. I mean, sort of? <laughs> What do you mean? There is no way that those two things aren't connected. I mean, maybe, but I guess it's a win. I would consider it a win. Spread the magic. And then, less than an hour before we began recording, <laughs> some more stuff started unraveling. So, earlier, Lloyd Cameron Russell Moyle is a British labor politician who's a member of parliament, wrote a article for the Tribune magazine, basically as a rebuttal to J.K. Rowling's statement. But specifically, he was making the claim that she was using her experience of sexual assault to discriminate against trans people, which she 100% was. I, I don't know what the point of putting that in there was if that's not what she was doing but anyway on the 28th he tweeted a apology stating i want to apologize unreservedly about the comments in the article i wrote last week to the tribune regarding trans rights in which i mentioned jk rowling 
J.K. Rowling's first disclosure of domestic abuse and sexual assault in her recent article on trans issues were heartfelt and must have been hard to say. Whilst I disagree with some of her analysis on trans rights, it was wrong of me to suggest that she used her own dreadful experience in anything other than good faith. But was it, though? <laughs> <laughs> so, so many people involved in this conversation, people speaking up for trans rights that are getting tons of hate mail, and J.K. Rowling has received over 3,000 emails thanking her for speaking up. In positive news, Universal Orlando has opened back up with 35% capacity in virtual lines. Yeah. <laughs> virtual lines are cool. Daniel Radcliffe has started a podcast with David Holmes. David Holmes was his stunt double for all eight films and was paralyzed while rehearsing a stunt for the last film. And so the podcast is called Cunning Stunts. And the purpose is to highlight and pay tribute to the work that stunt performers do in the name of entertainment. Interesting. It is currently only available on iTunes, Spotify, and Podomatic. Hmm. I'll have to check that out. Jesse Cave, who played Lavender Brown in the last three films, is pregnant with her third child. Congratulations. And in autism news, we have a new PBS Kids series called Hero Elementary in which one of the characters is autistic. He is high-functioning. His name is AJ Gadgets. And I watched an episode, and if I didn't know going into it, I wouldn't have known. Really? It is very subtle. It is mainly, when he speaks, he speaks in very direct, scientific way. Okay. I'm not saying it's not accurate, I'm just saying it was subtle and not very noticeable. Sometimes that's a good thing, though, I feel like, to just yes. do it subtly. <laughs> and that does it for this episode. If there was something in this that sparked something in you, or you found a metaphor that we missed and would like to join the conversation, you can do that by sending us owl mail at spewcast at gmail.com. You can send us a letter or a howler. You can um, send us a howler also by calling 407-706-SPEW or clicking the link in the description. Our website is spewpod.uk and you can check us out on Twitter at Spectrum People. Or Facebook at facebook.com slash spewcast. We're also on Instagram. Our handle is at spewpod. And we're on TikTok at spewcast again. And our theme music is by Joan Burr. Until next time. I'm Quirinus. And I'm Lavender. And as Luna Lovegood said, don't worry, you're just as sane as I am. Bye. Bye. <laughs>